Now that it has been over a year since starting the Brainwaves podcast, I've discovered this entire underground consortium of bloggers, podcasters, and alternative medical educators who have been doing basically the same thing I'm trying to do, but for years. Some for even a decade or more. I'm only reinventing the wheel. But, unlike these other groups, the content in Brainwaves focuses solely on neurology. Nobody else really does this. NPR's Hidden Brain addresses the social science of neurology, as does Inquiring Minds and Health Files. SciFry is a popular podcast about science in general, and these are all great shows. I definitely recommend them. Most of the other educators and groups specialize in emergency medicine, where understandably podcasts and other quick bursts of educational content are most frequently accessed. The lifestyle of an ED physician revolves around these kinds of rapid-fire, high-impact, concise clinical snippets. I might say that most neurologists have embraced a more laissez-faire lifestyle in comparison. At least I've done that when outside the boundaries of brainwaves. Anyway, I recently collaborated with one of these educators, Owen Wood, who's the founder of Ditch Doc EM, a pre-hospital critical care blog, on some of the neurology content for his site. It's a pretty cool site, actually with solid blog entries for paramedics and ED personnel, as well as videos and quizzes to assess your knowledge. You can check it out at ditchdocem.com. That's ditch, D-O-C-E-M dot com. Where Owen has developed such an allegiant following that he even sells swag associated with his blog. I'm definitely not there yet. With the swag, I mean. But if you really want a Brainwaves coffee mug or a pencil sharpener, I'm sure we can work something out. This episode was brought to you in part by Audible. With nearly 200,000 ad-free audiobooks, I'm sure you'll find something you'd like. I recommend Brain on Fire by Susanna Cahallan. It's the story of a Washington Post reporter who described in vivid detail her battle with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. To hear this book and get your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com brainwaves and sign up. The first month is free and less than 15 bucks a month for each subsequent month with no cancellation fees. So take a minute to sign up for free at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. In working with Owen, we decided it would be valuable for his readers to learn about the similarities and differences between aphasia and delirium. This is really challenging, and I had a tough time working on that blog. I had to phone a few friends for some tips. But in this Brainwaves brief, we'll try to do that topic some justice starting with the clinical vignette. Two weeks ago, I was called to the emergency room to see a patient who was confused. She was 71 years old, carried a history of hypertension and mild cognitive impairment, but was fully independent at baseline. She was brought in by her family because that evening after dinner, she was not acting like herself. Her son, who she lives with, found her sitting alone in the study and staring at a wall. When he asked her if she was okay, she responded, Oh yeah, the wall needs new paint. He escorted her to her bedroom, but when he asked her if she was going to brush her teeth, she replied, I'm just taking my time. After a few more questions, it became obvious to him that she did not understand what he was asking her. Not at all. So he brought her to the emergency room for evaluation, and eventually I was called to see her to determine if she was experiencing delirium, or maybe if she had an aphasia. But before we even get into the differences between aphasia and delirium, why is this even important? What's the big deal? The reason you want to recognize aphasia from delirium is because their causes and management are polar opposites. Aphasia is caused by a focal cortical lesion, like a stroke, a tumor, or a neurodegenerative syndrome. In contrast, delirium is caused by a systemic disturbance, something like sepsis, hypoglycemia, or uremia, which can cause a global cerebral dysfunction. Focal, global. You wouldn't give a septic patient who's delirious TPA, would you? I mean, that would be crazy. So how does a neurologist go about this? The first thing that's immediately obvious to the examiner is how the language is produced and comprehended. Even this can be tricky for some experts. So your first pearl is to figure out how to describe the features of a patient's language. Are the words clearly enunciated, favoring aphasia? The NHS was started on the 5th of July, 1940. Or are they slurred, favoring delirium? That's the weirdest microphone I've ever seen in my life. 
Is the patient's speech grammatically correct? I'm not very good at this kind of thing. Delirium. Or lacking in appropriate syntax. And I have been very, very, yeah, friend, somebody, uh, yeah, uh, uh, an incredibly uh, loyal. Aphasia. Is the patient's prosody or their pattern of speech fluent? Watch, I'm going to read this thing. For decades, Shep Gordon... Had Delirium or irregular. I'm ir- right. Yeah. I am... Um, Aphasia. Can the patient understand spoken language, delirium, or is there a major difficulty with following simple verbal or written commands, aphasia? Naming and repetition should also be assessed as a part of any neurologic examination, but impairment in these modalities is not as useful in distinguishing delirium from aphasia. Next, and what challenges providers the most, I think, is when a patient suddenly has difficulty following commands or if their speech is nonsensical. Is it delirium, or is it a receptive sensory aphasia? Recall that delirium is defined by, one, its fluctuating course, and two, inattention, whereas aphasia lacks both of these features. But in the acute setting where the patient's not following commands, it could be either. So there's no way to know if the course is fluctuating yet. And here's your second pearl. In an acutely altered patient, the provider has to identify whether the patient can maintain attention or not. This is the second major feature of delirium. Attention can be evaluated using a number of tasks that may either rely on spoken language, like assessing serial sevens or spelling world backwards, 193, or something that doesn't assess spoken language, for instance, giving the patient a drawing task. The motor evaluation of inattention in a delirious patient involves testing for asterixis, either with arms and wrists fully extended or having the patient squeeze the fingers of the examiner, i.e. the milkmaid sign. A delirious patient will struggle with these tasks. The aphasic patient, in contrast, is likely to be able to carry out most of these commands. Thirdly, know that misery loves company. What I mean in this context is, neurologic deficits don't often occur in isolation. A keen examiner can often recognize more than one clue which could help him or her localize the lesion. Consider language lateralization for this aspect. In nearly every right-handed patient, language localizes to the left hemisphere. I don't always count on this for left-handed patients, where a quarter of patients are right hemisphere dominant or may even have a more, quote, distributed language function. Assuming the examiner has this information in the acute setting, usually from the patient's family or friends who have brought them into the hospital, This kind of information could prove useful. Third pearl, in knowing the patient's handedness, the examiner may attend more closely to functions of neighboring brain regions in order to distinguish a focal neurologic deficit from a global cerebral impairment. For example, in a right-hand dominant patient, you might try to tease out a pronator drift of the right hand, signifying a corticospinal tract injury pattern of weakness. Or you might see relatively slower tapping of the right fingers or the toes or feet also indicating subtle corticospinal tract dysfunction. In the left-handed patient, you might look for these subtle signs on either hemibody. Getting back to the case of the 71-year-old woman I saw in the emergency department a few weeks ago, she was ultimately diagnosed with aphasia. Her words were clearly enunciated, although her speech was not perfectly grammatically correct, and she made inappropriate comments to questions and commands in keeping with the first clinical pearl. She was able to maintain attention well, second clinical pearl, and on further neurologic assessment, she had mild weakness of her right face and arm, that final pearl, misery loves company. A beautiful localization to the left posterior frontal and parietal lobes for all you neurologists out there. But we're not done yet. Before we wrap up this week, I just want to quickly mention that delirium can also be misdiagnosed in the setting of other syndromes besides aphasia. For instance, you might suspect an expressive aphasia in a patient with hypoactive delirium. They're just not talking. Usually because of some underlying psychiatric disease, or Wernicke's encephalopathy. Maybe for the hypoactive delirium, I would be more worried about the patient having an acute aphasia and try to expedite a stroke evaluation because the risk of missing a stroke is greater than the risk of missing a hypoactive delirium. 
But, in the case of Wernicke's, I don't think any provider would hesitate to start high-dose intravenous thiamine replacement in order to prevent the mammillary bodies from frying themselves and the patient's encephalopathy becoming more permanent. Additionally, delirium can mimic focal neurologic deficits like Anton syndrome, which is a bilateral occipital lobe disorder, usually due to bilateral posterior cerebral artery infarctions, or the Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is a retinal disorder that results in visual release phenomenon, aka hallucinations, usually related to age-related macular degeneration. Remember that the E in the delirium acronym actually stands for eyes and ears, since loss of visual or auditory input can induce delirium in some older patients. I really think that it's fascinating that both Anton's and Charles Bonnet syndrome are the result of impaired visual perception, and both can mimic delirium, Anton's representing a defect in cortical processing of visual information, and Charles Bonnet being a defect in the perception and transmission of visual information to the brain. So for this reason, it's imperative to do your best to get a complete and thorough neurologic exam, including at minimum pupillary reactivity and visual field assessment, even in a patient with suspected delirium who may not be cooperating as well. Otherwise, you might fail to see something, just like your patient. Sorry for the tangent about the other neurologic mimics of delirium. This talk was really meant to be about aphasia. The bottom line is, and your take-home point today, when you suspect a focal cortical lesion in the setting of presumed delirium, don't be afraid to speak up, because your patient may not be able to. <laughs> oh god, I just can't stop with these puns. Alright, that's all we've got for you for Brainwaves this week, continuing medical audiocation for the neurologist and for trainees. Thanks for tuning in. Please let us know what you think about this podcast by rating us on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or Facebook at facebook.com slash Brainwaves Podcast. Be sure to check us out on Instagram at Brainwaves Podcast as well. The music this week was produced by Josh Woodward under a Creative Commons license. I'm Jim Sigler. Talk to you next time. <laughs>